speak uh, at this year's DEF CON voting village. I'm going to talk about how to weaponize RLAs to discredit an election. Um, my name is Carsten Sherman. I'm actually working in Copenhagen at the Center for Information Security and Trust. And uh, some of the results I'm going to talk about today actually based on joint work with Asmita De Lela and uh, Oksana Kuduk. So let's just uh, dive right in. A risk limiting audit. We probably have heard already uh, in the past talks that uh, you know risk limiting audits, what they are, and so on. Let me just kind of uh, recapitulate and uh, summarize what they are. So risk limiting audits are a statistically sound auditing method. So there's no question about it, and uh, you know I think it's really important to emphasize that uh, it is a sound method. It's statistically proven correct. Uh, many people in the world have uh, looked at the math behind it. They all agree that this, the, mass, the mass of testing is right. And uh, so there is in this talk, I am not going to uh, uh, put in question if risk limiting audits are sound or not. I'm just saying um, they are sound. And the idea of a risk limiting audit is, of course, to identify and automatically correct an erroneous uh, election result. And I have uh, here actually uh, made a little drawing of how risk limiting audits actually work. Um, you basically have paper ballots. There's a paper pa a ballot ma manifest, which uh, tells you how the um, ballots are stored, where you can find paper ballots and so on. And then there's, of course, the result. Uh, here's my laser pointer. So here's the result. And uh, when you start a risk limiting audit, you first need to kind of uh, compute the sample size. And the way how you do it is you take the results, you know, depending on what kind of a system you have, you look for the margins, um, you have to determine what kind of risk, uh, risk limit you want. That means how confident do you want to be that the erroneous election result was actually being caught and corrected. And once you have that, you have computed a sample size. Now you have to draw um, a random sample of the ballots. And for that, you need the ballot manifest. And you need to enter some kind of entropy to make it truly random because a, a risk limiting audit that doesn't draw a random sample is actually not a very good uh, audit. So once you know which ballots you want to draw, you actually then can start going to the ballot box and do the real audit. You basically follow the information um, of the sample, which tells you, you know, go to this thing and uh, check out this ballot and uh, do whatever you have to do with it. And then once you have done the audit and the outcome is like, yes, I found enough collect, uh, statistical evidence to kind of support the claim that the election result is correct, or I, I didn't, in which case I have to go back, go to a bigger sample. In the worst case, we'll have to do a full uh, recount. So this is the idea of a risk limiting audit. And uh, we all know that risk limiting audits come in many, many different flavors. flavors. There's the a ballot polling audit, which is an audit where we are going to draw a sample and trying to kind of uh, find support, uh, statistical support for the correctness of this election result. Or we do a ballot level comparison audit, where we, for example, check that the ballot is actually correctly registered on the uh, cast vote record, the CVR record. So that there are many different ways. And the reason why I'm actually saying this is because in this talk, I'm actually going to focus mostly on ballot level comparison audits um, because that was the easiest and uh, that also um, scales up to other countries beyond the United States, because I believe that the findings are actually kind of important, not just for the United States, but also for other countries. So now, if we do a ballot level comparison audit, let's just look at one example here, is uh, um, the result of uh, the Colorado 2016 election. And uh, I'm displaying, you show you a picture here of uh, Philip Stark's tools that actually uh, computes the, ballot, uh, the, um, the size of the sample. And so how does it actually go about doing this? Yes, so you um, basically take that tool, which is available from Philip Stark's homepage, you type in the numbers, and then at the end, you um, just press return. You also kind of choose the risk limit, which is here 95% of the risk limit is 5%. And so you get 95% confidence that the res election result is correct. And you do something with these overvotes, uh, overstatements and understatements. Um, uh, no worry about that. But once you hit calculate size, it actually kind of uh, comes up here as a result. And the result is 142 ballots. Okay. 
So I have given this talk and showed this slide many times in the past. And um, what my experience is that uh, people, especially election officials, they're really excited about the audit data, risk limiting audit. But when they hear the number 142, they say like, oh, now how can that be true? This cannot possibly be true. That's just not, uh, that's just not, that doesn't sound right. Only 142 votes you have to look at in order to be 95% sure that the that the election result of the presidential election 2016, the Colorado result, is actually correct. Um, yeah. So because I've given this talk so much and I've seen the faces of the audience, it kept me thinking. It's like, you know, with risk in audits, what we want to do is we want to make sure we want to provide some form of evidence and check that the election result is correct, not necessarily recounting the whole thing, but just do it in a statistically relevant way. But if the number is so small, can that be misused in one way or the other? And therefore, I actually came up with this, this research question, which is like, can one mechanize RLAs to discredit an election? And uh, it has always puzzled me that um, the face of the uh, people in the audience when I talk about this. And, and so what I want to show you in this talk is, I want to show you that I believe that this is actually possible. And uh, in order to convince you about this, I structured this talk in five different easy to follow steps, I hope. The first one is um, I'm going to talk about the disinformation playbook. Um, that's uh, really a, uh, a study of a, uh, um, a group of uh, scientists, concerned scientists, that came up with uh, you know, different plays how companies actually in the health sector are um, you know, using or misusing um, information to construct disinformation campaigns that are actually helping their cause. Then second step, I'm going to identify vulnerable assumptions in the RLA. And uh, one is of particular interest, and that is that of the sample size. Then we're going to conduct or describe to you a you, the results of a user study that we have recently conducted in the United States. And uh, then I try to argue that uh, with that information at hand, you actually can design a disinformation campaign where people, when they listen to it and are easily made to believe things that are not right, uh, one can kind of change their, um, their, one most likely, I should say, can change their perception um, of that. And lastly, I would like to talk about uh, a few defense mechanisms that uh, I think are mostly um, informal and some are more useful than others, um, but I think there's some more research to be done. Okay, so let's look at the uh, disinformation playbook. So the disinformation playbook, as I already mentioned, um, is, uh, is was published in 2017 by the Union of Concerned Scientists. Now, is that a good reference? Well, I don't know, but it actually kind of, when I read these five points, um, it made a lot of sense to me. I'm not sure if these are the, if, the, if that's a complete list of things that one can do um, in order to uh, define or if it classifies all possible ways to organize a disinformation campaign, but I think they are definitely uh, valid and useful. So let me just kind of review them. There's the fake play of that is, that's, about, that's always this, the in front of it where you do counterfeit science and try to pass it off a legit, uh, legitimate research. So, you know, here for the RLAs, it could be, uh, you know, um, making some other statistics, which is obviously wrong and say like, you know, see, this is how you should do and not like the ones, how the RLAs are really conducted. The blitz is you harass the scientists who speak out with the results and inconvenient views. Um, I think the community around RLAs has become so big that this is actually not really a concern, but nevertheless, it's one of the plays in the disinformation playbook. The diversion technique is uh, you manufacture uncertainty about science where it is possible. So I think the diversion is actually where you leave the science and the results intact, but you manufacture certain kind of arguments and uh, collect evidence that uh, can show um, uh, where you misuse the science and you argue exactly the con contrary. So that this diversion uh, play is the one that uh, will keep us busy here and we'll return to it at the end of this talk. Then there's the screenplay. You buy credibility through alliances with academic and professional societies to make it look okay. So I cannot talk uh, about uh, anyone else, but you know, I've never been approached on any of those issues. 
And then there's the fix, you manipulate government officials or processes to influence policy. Um, that kind of is also somewhat relevant here, but we will see, it's not the main focus of this talk, but the main focus is the diversion. So that's the uh, disinformation playbook. When I say like, uh, um, you know, you do it, I'm talking about some kind of a disinformation architect, an adversary who is trying to kind of uh, uh, influence public opinion in a particular way and try to sway it either in this direction or the other. So the question therefore is, who are the disinformation architects that might have an interest in order to do something about risk living audits? And I think there they we have to distinguish two levels, namely the global level in which our nation states who are interested in meddling this one's election. And there's of course the local level, which actually is uh, not to be neglected, where there are activists and political parties that try to argue and, uh, and uh, um, argue their way want to uh, you know discredit a risk limiting audit in one way or the other okay so uh you know the local level i think is like when we talk about election security in a general uh, space i think the local level is particularly worrisome because it actually takes only very very few people to influence public opinion and here we have a um, um on the right you see a newspaper clipping uh, majority of COVID misinformation comes from only 12 people. So that's a very recent, um, that's a very recent uh, observation from uh, maybe one or two weeks ago. Okay, so this is what I wanted to say about the disinformation play playbook. Let's move on and talk about identifiable vulnerable assumptions in risk limiting audits. And I would like to kind of point out three. Okay, so there is the first assumption that we make, that is that the integrity and the security of the paper trail is intact for an audit. So that means that after ballots are cast on election day and before the audit is commenced, it's usually you know, a few days, a few weeks that pass in the middle or in between, we need to kind of make sure that the paper trail is secure. Okay, and so we assume that the security mechanisms that are put in place actually are sufficient. Another a part of this assumption is also, you know, you also have to, to kind of um, assume that the risk limit of 95% is acceptable for the people. I mean, if it's too, too little, um, if they say like, well, 5% uh, risk, it's, it's not unacceptable for us. We need to be 99.9% .9 sure. Sure, um, you can do it. But when you do an audit, you have to deter, deter, define the risk limit before you start the audit. Assumption number two, yeah, it's the, the sample size that you actually compute. So the number that comes out of those things, as I mentioned earlier, can be very, very small, 142 for a, a ballot level comparison audit in Colorado, um, not a very big size. And so the question is like, do people believe it? Do they accept it? Or could you maybe influence them to kind of uh, uh, think about this in another way? And the uh, third assumption is at the end is that the sample is actually drawn at random and not you know, staged and said, so like, you know, here, look, I pick my 142 ballots, they support everything, but you have already pre-computed exactly and sorted them in such a way that the 142 ballots are actually exactly there to support your, your claim. So this is why the statistical sample has to be statistics. Now for this talk, I'm only concentrating on if the number of ballots to be sampled is trustworthy. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the, the thing that we want to study. And uh, for that, we actually made a user study. So we made a user study and we went out and we used a particular platform, the prolific platform, which is used by many social scientists for doing studies like this. And uh, we just asked people, okay, so uh, what, what do you think about risk limiting audits? Uh, would you accept that result and so on? And below here, you see an example. So, uh, so number one is the uh, participants that we chose, they're all US citizens and the prolific platform, it's a crowdsourced platform. You can just kind of click, you know, where do you want the participants to be from? And because uh, we made the study right in the aftermath of the uh, 2020 election, we thought like, oh, that's, that seems to be a, a good thing. So let's just ask those people who have maybe read something about receiving audits in the newspaper, especially in Georgia. But we just kind of picked uh, um, any kind of demographic um, among all of the United States citizens that are registered on the prolific platform. And then our, um, um, our uh, user uh, questionnaire looked a little bit like this. 
we basically made a, a fake election, which has about 3 million votes cast, okay? And then we also, for every participant, we changed and, and you know, modified slightly the margin between the two candidates. So it's, a, it's a, always an election with two candidates, that's candidate A and candidate B. And, uh, you know, here is, um, okay, here, and then you, you, the, um, uh, the, the, the participant has to answer to certain questions. So one of these questions would be, if the candidate support lost in the election in the initials, what do you think an audit would be a good option to reconfirm the election result? And yes, no, maybe, and so on. So we kind of uh, wrote out um, the, we kind of introduced the risk limiting audits uh, just with a few words at the beginning of the study. So if the participant read this stuff carefully that we presented, should understand uh, basically what is a risk limiting audit, but at the same level of detail as I've tried to explain it to you here in this talk. Okay, so now what were our findings? So the first one is I call the law of the untrusted small numbers. And so we had actually two hypotheses that we wanted to confirm or uh, yeah, that we plan to confirm and both were actually confirmed. And I'll show you the, uh, the, some graphs on the next slide. So here's uh, hypothesis one, point one. When asked about their opinions about which number of ballots should be selected for auditing, the participants provide a number higher than the one prescribed by the RLA methodology. Um, and, you know, here the methodology is, as I said, a ballot uh, level comparison audit. Um, the hypothesis 1.2 is that the participants' confidence in the audit results changes when they are actually informed about the number of ballots selected for audit auditing. And uh, both of those things uh, are, are what we could confirm. And let me show you the graphs, okay? So here are two graphs. The first graph, uh, basically, here on the left, um, it shows you, it's a logarithmic scale, as you can see, uh, between 0.01% all the way to 10%, this would be 100% on the very top. Okay, so the top line is like all of the people who wanted to kind of have a full recount anyway. And here at the very bottom zero, these are all of the people who uh, didn't want to have a, uh, you know, didn't want to have a recount at all. Or a risk of an, or an audit at all. And here, these red points, so these orangey looking points, these are basically for each one of the questionnaire, we generated a different number. And uh, you can see they were uniformly distributed, which in retrospect wasn't that a clever idea because here there are very, very few, uh, uh, very, very few dots in the middle because when it goes to a, you know, it, it's just because the thing gets so incredibly. Um, you know, it, it grows very, very quickly. So, yes, you can see here, almost everyone wanted to have a number, felt comfortable with a number uh, above, and only a very few set of people, group of people actually wanted less. Um, so we could confirm, you know, doing all of the statistics and analysis and the testing and so on, we could confirm the hypothesis, number one, indeed, that people wanted to have a higher number. So, but this is not the interesting part. I think the interesting part is really um, the second graph here that you see on the line. Are people changing their minds when they actually learn about what is the number chosen? Okay. And so here you see these two uh, axes. There's the before axis and there's the after axis. So before, many people were actually kind of happy and okay with that. But if you tell them what the number is, suddenly people were not definitely yes was off the table. They were very surprised that these numbers were so small. And they didn't uh, think that this actually kind of, it didn't kind of grow any confidence in our sample. And again, we, uh, we did the statistics, we did the, the analysis, and we could confirm the hypothesis. Okay, so uh, this was, uh, you know, this was the, uh, the first, you know, first two hypotheses or the first hypothesis, two sub hypotheses. And we also had a second hypothesis. The second hypothesis is how about the justification for the sample size? Okay. So is that, uh, you know, the, the sample size comes out of a tool. And the question is, is there a difference in the effects on the voters' confidence in audits, depending on which selection criteria backs up the chosen number of the audited ballots? And so what we've actually thought, we kind of ask, you know, here different, uh, um, uh, different ba basically sources, yes? So there's the peer-reviewed scientific paper that tells you how big the source is. 
and uh, independent experts. So uh, not the experts that were um, tried to be bought um, in the disinformation and cook, so, but really independent, honest to God, you know, honest people. An agreement among political parties. Uh, political parties, do they agree? And, uh, so then we have mandated by court. The court says, you know, so and so many ballots have to be audited. Non-governmental organizations could also um, enter the NGOs could also enter the picture and give give some some uh, suggestions of uh, how big the numbers and just general legislation. And so, what we actually found out is yes. So uh, so here the peer-reviewed paper, most of the participants really trust the, the academic uh, um, the academic performance and uh, very many many fewer. Uh, actually, the legislation. So again, we did some statistic analysis, and we could confirm um, this this hypothesis. Okay. So now we move on to um, the limitations of the user study. Okay. So this was a quantitative research study. Of course, one could have done a qualitative research study as well, which we in part did, but I'm leaving this out out of this uh, um, uh, out of this presentation. Um, there is a paper where we describe all of this, which um, shortly appears on ArchiveX, and has been also accepted in, you know, at the eVote ID conference uh, in Bregenz, uh, in Austria, uh, this year. So, what else is there? There, we have to kind of make the, the standard bias disclaimers. Okay, although many social scientists are using crowdsourcing platforms. Uh, like as like prolific to do their studies, there's an inherent bias that might come with that, namely that only people with internet access actually kind of participate in this, more wealthy, more well-educated people. And that, you know, the same kind of comment and concern um, that you might have about the other studies also applies here, no question about it. So the third point is the limitations we have thought about um, ballot polling audits, and, uh, and we have not looked so much into ballot polling audits, but more in comparison audits. And the reason for that is because the study was actually meant to be more global. Uh, we did not just focus on the United States, uh, but we also wanted to kind of look at other countries, for example, Kenya, Sub-Saharan continent, um, you know, Kenya actually use restricting audits in order to uh, instill trust, uh, more trust in these kind of uh, countries. So, um, so this is why we have not done actually, um, and our questions did not aim to kind of uh, validate the choices that a ballot polling audit would give, but only the comparison audits. So we also did not uh, ask for any prior questions regarding uh, prior knowledge on RLAs. Uh, we just kind of uh, um, asked the, the people, you know, here, listen to this. These are the numbers. Do you trust it or not? Yes. Okay, so moving on to how do you design a disinformation campaign out of this? Okay. And uh, we only do this with the law of the untrusted number. So the first thing I would like to kind of point out here is that uh, there is actually no disinformation. I could not identify any inf uh, disinformation using my humble Google searching skills. Okay, so I just looked for um, on Google as like uh, Georgia, you know, which actually used the risk being audited in the 2020 election. So like, you know, what about Georgia? Georgia risk domain audit. And so I went to this, this list of uh, um, the list of uh, papers here and went to Fox News, I went to CNN, I tried to cover um, all of the different media and all of the media reported on the risk domain audit, but uh, they all did it in actually a very professional, neutral and technical way. So it was almost like, uh, you know, there was the only opinion I could actually uh, see in some of these articles were like, oh, RLAs, RLAs are good, but you know, essentially they're just recounts. Recounts are always better. RLAs are, are just, uh, you do an RLA if you want to, uh, you know, speed up and save costs and don't have to look to add so many ballots. So that was the only opinion. So it does not appear to me that anyone actually tried to kind of make a disinformation campaign out of this uh, um, law of small numbers that we, we identified with our, with our user study. Okay, so now you have probably already guessed it. The diversion disinformation claim would be very, very simple. You just make an, unsubst an unsubstantiated claim that the sample size is too small. And many people will say like, oh my goodness, yes, the sample size is too small. 
um, and that would uh, be the cause of uh, you know people actually trust the, you know changing their mind about should you trust the election result or should you not trust the election result. And then once you make that claim, now you have to kind of find a sample, uh, you know, a, a, a way to kind of uh, uh, distribute that information across the network. And you can either go to your favorite news outlet or you can do social media or you can do whatever the 12 people did or 17 people who spread all of the disinformation about uh, COVID vaccines. Um, it's not that I don't think it's terribly difficult. I think it can be done. And I think it's actually uh, uh, quite problematic and if something like this might happen and it's it's uh, i think it's it's it would be you know maybe one of the conclusions of the talk is um shall we just uh you know maybe think about um first of all what you know what can we do in order to mitigate um the uh, the impact of uh, such a, a diversion disinformation play um and i think uh, but we come to uh, to these mitigations um, in a little while. Okay. So the analysis that we've conducted very preliminary here is that um, such a disinformation uh, campaign would probably work best when the margins are wide, uh, because margins are wide, sample sizes are low, sample sizes are low, people don't trust it, and uh, you have a problem. So that's actually an observation which is which is uh, somewhat comforting. Also, when the when the um, sample size is too small, it will the RLA will trigger a full recount. You know, then um, it's also um, a, uh, a a technique, or you know, it's it will strengthen. Uh, if it's a full hand recount, there's no. It's basically a recount. It's no longer an RLA, and it will probably not affect uh, the trust. The things you know. So the uh, um, the smaller the margins. Um, or the larger the margins, um, the more, the higher the risk that uh, such a disinformation uh, play would actually be um, uh, successful. So, um, yeah, I I'm just want to mention studies related to poll, uh, bottle polling audits uh, can be left to future work. So for us, it's actually no problem to generate different uh, questionnaires that we can kind of send out to people using different crowdsourcing platforms which we plan to do in the fall. We haven't actually gotten to it yet, um, but uh, this is left to future work. And uh, there's a, a disclaimer. So, you know, just these, and maybe I'm repeating this one more time too many, but uh, we are talking about comparison audits here and not ballot polling audits. So when you do a ballot polling audit, then usually the, the numbers of the samples are, um, um, are slightly bigger. All right. So we're moving on to the defense mechanisms and the, the defense mechanisms is like, what can you actually do against a threat like such a diversion a disinformation play? Okay, so I think uh, there, are, I've, there are four things that uh, we have identified. And the first one would be, you know, target smaller constituencies. So when you do a risk giving audit, don't just do it on an entire country, but kind of uh, find a jurisdiction level, constituency level that is small enough so that uh, the the problem can be better compartmentalized. Now, of course, this idea is very much against any kind of legislation. The legislation says you have to sample like this, you have to sample like this, but uh, it doesn't say that these, uh, these ideas here of mitigations are practical or possible or possibly even useful, but these are just ideas. Okay, the second idea is um, something that uh, one could consider. I don't know what the negative side effect is, and that is to artificially inflate the sample size. So the system says, you know, pick 142 ballots, but you decide to uh, um, audit 1,420 ballots instead, uh, just because you know that uh, you know people might be more easily swayed to disbelieving the election result just because the sample size is too small. You could also strengthen basic education and statistics, which is like a very really sweeping uh, mitigation, which also is not really implementable. Um, and it will take many, many years to, uh, to, uh, to kind of come to fruition. But I think the fact is that uh, statistics can be somewhat counterintuitive at times. Um, and we've seen this with these small sample sizes here. So one way uh, to strengthen 
um, you know, or to mitigate the threat of a diversion uh, disinformation play, as uh, I've described earlier, is to just kind of strengthen basic education and statistics. And I don't know how to do this, maybe uh, doing, you know, using proactive kind of advertisement or uh, putting stuff on YouTube, explaining the things better, making more palatable, um, making uh, in uh, civil education classes for kids, you know, start uh, thinking about those kind of uh, uh, techniques of to uh, of how to mitigate um, these kind of threats. So these are all ideas. How practical they are, I don't know. And the other one is just be proactive. Um, that could be um, a. Uh, I, I'm a. I'm a strong believer in transparency. So, <coughs> so I think that would be uh, being proactive and uh, talking about it and presenting um, the, uh, the 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 real rationales why those numbers are so small continue actually um, putting these kind of information and uh, you know out in the public discourse that would be one way to mitigate the threat and with this i would like uh, uh, to thank you for your attention and i'm i'm ready to take questions thank you so much bye bye